Good evening. I want to welcome everyone to tonight's webinar, Dental School and Practice in the U.S. for International Dentists, presented by the American Student Dental Association. All attendees are muted so that we don't pick up any background noise during the program. The webinar is going to be recorded and it will be posted on ASDA's website and a link will be emailed to everyone who is registered for tonight's program. So I am Danielle Bauer. I am the facilitator for tonight's program. Um, I am one of the ASDA staff. There are 12 staff that work in the ASDA office in Chicago. And tonight's program is going to feature three panelists. Dr. Kinar Shah, who graduated in 20, 2012 from an advanced standing program at Boston University. Rami Bashai is a current advanced standing student at UCLA, and they will both share their experiences and advice for applying to dental school in the U.S. and finding a job. Hani Bushra is an attorney specializing in immigration law. He will provide information on the immigration process and options for residency in the U.S. For the last 30 minutes, we'll open up the webinar to your questions. So you will notice on the right side um, that there is a control panel and that you'll be able to type your questions right into the screen during tonight's program. So at the end, once all of our panelists have presented, um, we will answer questions in the order that they're submitted. Um, it would help if you direct your question directly to a specific panelist, but if you leave it general, we'll do our best um, to have the panelist who is best suited to answer it. Okay, so to get started, I want to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Kinar Shah. He's an international dentist from India and a graduate from the Advanced Standing DMD program at Boston University in Massachusetts. So he's been practicing for two years in Massachusetts, and during his time in the International Dental Program at Boston University, he was class president and served in the student government body. Over the last few years, he's guided many of his friends into acceptance to an international dental program and making the tr transition from school to practice in the United States. So I want to introduce Dr. Kinar Shah. Oh. You are muted. Sorry. There you go. Uh, there you can go. Can you hear me now? Yep. We can hear you. Okay. Do uh, you want me to repeat it? Yes, please. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Kinar, um, and I'm excited to be here uh, to share every, all the experiences that I had and uh, guide you, help you in any ways, answer any questions that you may have the best of my knowledge and I'm very excited to be part of this webinar and thank you for joining and uh, Daniel here back to you. Is it Daniel? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Kanar. All right. Oops. There we go. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to introduce our next panelist. So our next panelist is Rami Bashai, and Rami graduated from Carroll University in 2009. He did a one-year internship at Carroll University Hospitals and then served one year in the Army. He now attends UCLA and will graduate from the Advanced Standing Program in 2015. He is the founder and president of the UCLA Implant Study Club and the UCLA, UCLA Implant Festival. He currently serves on ASDA subcommittee for advanced standing students. He's been published in ASDA News, ASDA's blog Mouthing Off, and The Explorer, which is the journal of the student research at UCLA School of Dental Medicine. His microscopic picture was used as the cover photo for this journal. All right, I'd like to introduce Rami.
Let's see. Rami, you are muted. There you go. Hi, guys. How's it going? Uh, thank you, Danielle, for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you all for coming and for spending that time here. Uh, we're all here to help you out, to answer your questions. Um, and um, even after the webinar, just feel free to email any one of us. Um, and um, this pretty much it. Thank you. All right. So now for our last panelist. Okay. So the last panelist is Hani Bushra. He's an attorney at law. Hani is a first generation immigrant to the United States. He's born in Iraq to Egyptian parents. He came with his parents to the United States through the U.S. Diversity Lottery Program. He obtained his bachelor's degree in political science and philosophy and went on to obtain a Juris Doctorate degree from the University of San Diego. After becoming a member of the California Bar, he established his law practice in 2008 in beautiful Huntington Beach, focusing primarily on immigration law and practices internationally and nationwide. I'd like to introduce Hani Bushra. Oh, I think you're muted. There we go. I unmuted you. Sorry. Hi, everybody. I'm very excited to be with you guys today. I spent the last two hours brushing my teeth to make sure that my teeth are white and sturdy. <laughs> to speak with all of you here. Um, so I'm very excited to um, give you as much information as possible as I can and also to um, respond to any questions. My presentation is going to be very brief and I would like to hear your questions more than anything. Thank you very much. Okay, so, so before we get started with questions, so if you want to start typing your questions in there, but I wanted to go through um, just a few things um, that may help you in your future, some ASDA resources. And all of these resources are available on ASDA's website. Um, ASDA has a subcommittee of advanced standing students, uh, which Rami is a part of, and they help put together tonight's program. Um, they also just created a guide for international students applying to U.S. dental schools. So you can see that's the first item on this list. The second item is a website that lists the various options to pay for dental school. Um, the next item is a study resource for the National Board Dental Exams Part 1 and 2. So, you know, most international dentists are going to have to take those exams to get into a U.S. dental school. And ASDA sells reprints of the old exams that can be used to study. Um, if you're a member of ASDA, you do receive a discount. And the last resource is a guide that the American Dental Association has put together on the U.S. Uh, licensure process. And this can be downloaded in an um, electronic form. There is a cost for this, but if you are an ASDA member, you do get 25% off of the price. Um, so as I mentioned, many of these uh, resources and discounts are available to ASDA members. So as international dentists and as students, you have two options um, of joining ASDA depending on what your situation is. So if you are currently living in the U.S. and are planning to apply to a dental school in the U.S., you would qualify for our pre-dental membership. So that is $63 a year. Um, if you live outside of the U.S. and are attending an international dental school, you would qualify for an international dental student membership. And this also includes membership in the American Dental Association. And that membership is $93. So the link shown on your screen gives you more information about each of those categories, and that's where you can join. Okay, so... 
We will get to questions, but here is contact information for each of our panelists. So if your question um, does not get answered um, or you have uh, specific questions for one of them, you can go ahead and email them after the program. All right. So if all the panelists want to turn on their webcams and come on, We'll start with the questions. Um, let's see. Um, sorry, one second. All right. So, question one. Um, will probably uh, be either uh, Kanar or Rami, and it says, how important is each skill of the TOEFL exam for um, an advanced standing program? Mm, Rami, you want to answer? Uh, you can go ahead. Uh, for TOEFL, when I took, that was about five, six years ago. Oh. Now they've changed the format a little bit, but so, yes, each of them are just as important. Uh, every uni every school has their different requirements. Whatever requirements they ha you have to meet, you have to meet. Otherwise, they will not consider your score. Um, as a, consider you as a strong candidate. But again, all the questions are just all the sections are just as important reading, comprehension, uh, speaking, everything. Yeah, uh, concerning that, yeah, as, as Kimon said, that each each school has a cut, cut score. Cut score means that, let's say UCLA, they have a cut score of 100. This doesn't mean that someone applied with a 98 will not get an interview or will not get in, but 100 will make you, will put you on the safe side of, uh, of the application and everything. And um, and so it's very important. You, you do not want to get a low score in that. It's very important because they need to know that when you be integrated in the program, they need to know that you can keep a conversation, you'll understand the lecture, and you'll make the most out of the, out of the program. So yeah, study for it and try to take it in your home country. Don't try to take it in the US, for example. So actually, some people go to some places to take it because the person who's who's going to judge you and give you the score, compare you to the other. So, so you need to, um, it's, it's prefer preferable if you, if you take it in your home country. So, yeah. Thank you. Great. All right. The next question is, is a master's program important to get accepted? So probably for either Rami or Kanar. I would I would go I would answer the question. So master's program is it important? Um, is it an absolute necessary? No. Uh, but it, is it nice to have? Yes, absolutely yes. Uh, if you have already started master program, then a lot of dental schools they they expect you to finish the master's program before you join them. So they would they would try try to get that answer by asking you indirectly or if you can just be upfront and tell them, hey, this is my plan. Um, I plan to finish my program at this point and right after that I plan to start my dental school. That's a great way to present yourself. Okay. Um, next one is how should we provide our personal statements? Like what parts should we mention? So maybe one of them, you could talk a little bit about your personal statement and what's important to include in it. So um, I remember when I, when I started writing my personal statement. So I'm from Egypt. My school in Egypt, we didn't have to write any personal statement. So it was something new for me. I didn't know what to do. So I went online. And, and one of the things that, uh, that you want to do in your personal statement that it should be personal means that it should stand out from other people, so um, so so you can share something personal about yourself that help shaping your personality the way you are right now, and um, and 
and and you can talk about it and you can make it make the transition smooth from what happened to why you want to become a dentist and why you want to come to the U.S. and and go from there. So um, share about something personal. Personal statement has to be personal, and and um, and yeah, this is uh, this. Big one. But this is very important, by the way. I mean, it took me months of getting my personal statement ready, and I was sent it to. 10 people that I know that they have been through this and everybody gave me a comment so we, you need to put um, a good amount of effort thinking in that in that part of the application because it's very important. <clears throat> I would also like to add into this um, regarding the personal statement I see it this way it's like you want to show your personal side in a very professional way uh, just, just like Rami said it should not be choppy there's so many there's few criteria for personal statement to be standing out, uh, being flow. See the thing is you want to start <clears throat> basically in different paragraphs. The first one, what made you go to the dental school or choose dentistry? That's your beginning point. And that's when you can highlight a little bit of your personal side. After that you are uh, entering in the school and when you were in dental school in India or whichever your home country, you tell them how that decision was right, how it got you more excited, what are the good sides, what, is, what are the things that you really like and you got passionate about it. And you want to mention over there uh, if uh, at the end that what made you come to the States. You can add it if you have any additional professional experience. Um, so the second paragraph would be like school. The third paragraph you can mention about your clinical experience in home country plus what made you come to the U.S. And in the fourth paragraph you tell them how is your experience coming to the U.S. and how is your experience when you got exposed to the actual dent how the dentistry is performed in the U.S. What are the things you really like? What are the things that got you even more excited, exceeded your expectations? And after that, you tell them, that, hey, I'm excited to um, be part of your program. I'm um, very passionate about dentistry. I want to continue my education. Uh, tell your um, all this professional experience. And at the same time, in your personal statement, you also want to keep on highlighting your uh, str strengths. And what is your plan uh, after dental school? So that will make total sense. And you, even though these are different parts of your life, you want to make sure that everything flows. Plus, nothing is uh, choppy. That's what it means. Plus, uh, it should not be redundant. It should not be like someone is reading and okay, 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 take me to the end, take me to the end. Oh, I'm got con I got confused. So, in order to avoid that just like Rami said, have people review your personal statement. People who is in the field of dentistry versus people who are not in the field of dentistry. Someone who doesn't know you because that's how it's going to be evaluated by the interviewer. So those are the few things plus any, any paperwork, any statement that you submit, it should be concise to the point. Try to eliminate as many words as you can but you still want to get your point across. Um, when I was applying to the dental school, I, I was in a public health program and I had a career development department person who really, really helped me. And that's what they do. They are the professionals who help you for designing your personal statement, designing your resume, uh, helping you prepare for interview. So if you are in public health program or any programs like that, you should definitely take the benefit of them. And um, they, will, they will really help you shape your personal statement, everything. Plus, knowing that our English is different, slightly different in different countries. So they will help you choose the right terms. For example, we call, in, in my country, we call dental clinic. But dental clinic in the States, it, mean, it has a different meaning to it. Uh, we call dental college in India, but here they call dental school. So those are the words that they differ, and you don't want someone who is reading here, uh, 
who is reading your personal statement get confused. Oh, okay, so he was working in the clinic, so it's going to be something like this. So he's going to have a different picture in mind. So when I was um, help, having other people review it, they really asked me, okay, is this what you mean by this? And I'm like, no, 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 I, I mean this. And they helped me, okay, so you want to change it, change this word, you want to paraphrase this, things like that. Um, I hope that I answered the question. Yeah, that was great. Um, so the next question has to do with volunteering. Uh, this person has had some uh, issues in getting uh, some volunteer work in the California area. So they're wondering if you can provide ideas of how they can go about volunteering or how they can find volunteer opportunities. Did either of you volunteer? And I did. Um, I can answer the question. Okay. Okay. So basically, even for volunteering, um, so I asked the same person in career development, hey, I need to volunteer. What should I do? And she helped me make a resume plus a cover letter. And I just Googled which are the dentists who, who are closer to me where I can go and shadow them. And I just picked up, uh, printed out the list, and I went to the individual office, handed to them personally, and I told, and I asked them uh, instead of saying, "Hey, uh, my name is Kinar, and I'm giving you a resume if I can come and shadow you." I took a little different approach. Hey, my name is Dr. Shah. I'm a dentist, and I wanted to speak to the dentist here because a lot of times the people who work in the front desk they don't want anyone coming in. Plus a lot of times they are told by the dentist not to bother them uh, because a lot of salesmen and all that come. So, but when you tell them that you are a doctor and you want to speak to the dentist, they give, they see you as in a different way and you can see you can talk to the dentist. Probably they went through the same uh, route that you are planning to go through. You know, uh, And once they get to know you, they will definitely be more welcoming. They are likely to be more welcoming. Um, though that was one of the hurdles that I had to face in the beginning. Um, at one office, I dropped my resume, and luckily the owner wasn't there before. But he passed by, and he looked at the resume, and he called me. But otherwise, most of the people they just turned me off, and they said I cannot speak to the dentist. It was interesting, um, but definitely have a resume, have a cover letter, speak to the dentist and you should be good. Yeah, and I wanted to mention that um, also on our website, we do have a what we call a shadowing guide that we've developed that gives some, uh, some different ideas of how to find someone that, to volunteer in their office. So I'd recommend going to our website and downloading that guide as well. Um, okay, so the next question has to do with residency programs. Um, they're asking which states offer it and which specialties, and can you practice in the U.S. after that? So, um, Kanar, I'm not sure if you know all the states, but maybe if you could talk a little bit, because I know you did a residency, if you could talk a little bit about that process. I did not do any residency. Oh, you didn't. But this question, this question itself is a little vague. When you are talking about residency, are you talking about doing a dental school and then doing a residency versus having a dental dentist degree from another country and then jumping directly into residency program. Both ways it's possible. The one you have your dental degree from your home country and now you want to do a advanced degree which is a residency then yes you can do it. Very few schools accept those candidates with National Board 1 and 2 scores. However, once you graduate, you may be, you will probably have a limited license, which means you can practice only in that school or that particular building or in only community health centers. So that is rest, dental degree from your home country and a residency directly here. 
And after doing the residence, you can still apply to the dental school so that you are not confined to the boundaries of that building, but you can go anywhere in the U.S. Um, to practice dentistry. Re did I answer the question? Uh, if, Daniel, if you can ask the attendees if that was the question that I answered. There's something I can add to what Kanar said is uh, residency program, you have to check each school um, if they have a program for international graduates or not. So you have to go by yourself to get a list of the dental school in the U.S. and check. So, for example, uh, UCLA, we have ortho for international applicants. We have uh, AGD. We have um, endo for international applicants. So you might need to check that yourself. And, and that, so it's not related to the states, it's related to the schools, okay? Second thing, the schools that you can, what, what you can do, you can um, practice, but in limited number of states. So, for example, you can practice on seven states or nine states, I'm not sure what states exactly. You need to, to check of, of the dental association of each state. Some people talk about something called reciprocation, it means that, let's say I went for a specialty, and this specialty, let's say I went to ortho at UCLA, but I cannot practice in California, so I went to Texas because I can practice in Texas. After three to five years, you can practice anywhere in the U.S. So you can just do something called reciprocation. You might need to look into it, but after that, you can practice anywhere in the U.S. after this reciprocation. Other people do what can I say, is they get the specialty, and then they get the, uh, the DDS or DMD in order to to save three years or five years, it's, it's totally uh, and one more thing. One more thing to add, uh, in your dent if you are already in dental school and looking for this information, the student affairs has answer to your question and they will help you find the answer. Um, and also, um, I, in the slide before this, I had, um, shown a link for ADA does a guide on understanding licensure for international dentists and at the very back of that guide they do list uh, some of the residency programs that accept international dentists. Now as Rami said it may I think it changes frequently so you'd always want to call and verify that but at least it might give you a place to start. Um, the next question is, if someone does a six, has a six to seven month gap in their application, does that weaken their chance for an interview? What is the meaning of six to seven months gap? I, th I think it may mean in their experience, possibly. She didn't do anything in, in seven months. So she's con or he is concerned that this might affect the application. I think it, there is always something good about doing something. So it means that it's it's better to to have to not have gaps. But however, this will not weaken your application to the point that you will not get an interview because of that. So uh, six months is not a big deal, I think, at all. Uh, but um, it's always better to fill up your time with something, volunteer somewhere. Do something related to dentistry. Go for a mission. Um, just do something gives the impression that you are a hard worker and you can make it happen if you get in. So, so, but it's not like it, it's not a good thing. But at the same time, it's not the worst that can happen to your application. Or it's not something that is very bad. No, it's not. It's neutral. I would say. Uh, I would. I can add a few things in here. Uh, now I understand the question about the gap. The thing is, you want to highlight your strengths. That's the thing. Uh, even though six months, you may not be in touch with dentistry, but there may be something else that you did, then now and which helped you learn something that you want to implement to dentistry. Maybe you were, maybe somebody was in sales, or maybe somebody was studying something else, but you want to bring that what you learned there to dentistry and. And you and you and you are happy about that. Uh, again, you want to show your strengths. You want to highlight that. You don't want to highlight that six months you didn't do nothing. That's it. Okay. 
Um, the next question says, does attending a preceptorship program play an important role into acceptance? Rami, you want to answer? Um, so, so it might help that people get to know you. So, for example, UCLA has a preceptorship program. So it might help that people get to know you, that you're a hard worker, you get letters of recommendation from people um, inside the school or in the U.S. However, this is not a guarantee that you'll be in. Okay, I, I didn't do any preceptors, I didn't do anything, I just came here right away. So, so it might help that people get to know you and get, get to write you a good letter of recommendation. This might help. Uh, the second, but it's quite expensive as well, so you might need to to do the math that if it's worth it or not. Does it help? Yeah, it will help because it's a U.S. experience, and this this something looks good in your resume. Okay, so so this something might help, but it's not a guarantee at the same time. What about masters? Masters are always a good thing. It depends on what you, what you want to do in life. I mean, if you want to do masters just to get into the international program, you might work hard to get into the in the international program. Do masters help? Yes, they might help, uh, but it's all about what you want to do. So, yeah, of course masters will help. I mean, when you apply to a program and uh, you have a master's degree and the other person doesn't have a master's degree, you will look better. But this, the, this still, this is not a guarantee that they will take you. It's all about the interview and the bench exam. And everything. So. Exactly. Okay. Um, there are quite a few questions asking about an SOP. Um, I'm not entirely sure what that is, but they want to know what an SOP should contain. So maybe you could talk a little bit about the... Statement the, of purpose. Okay. The personal statement. Is yes. That, okay. All right. I, I mean, I think you, you covered that earlier. I don't know if you had anything else to say about the personal statement. Same thing. The only thing that okay. I might add, Rami, you want to say something? Yeah, the only thing that I might add, just make the transition smooth between the paragraphs. So, Kinar said it should be like maybe three, four paragraphs, five max, but you should make the transition smooth. Like the last line in the second paragraph has something to do with the third one, the first line in the third paragraph. So, you should make the transition uh, smooth and don't make it two pages. People will not read that, okay? So put yourself in the shoes of the program director. He has like 600 personal statements. Make it short, one page, one and a half max, but make it try to make it one page, straight to the point, and that's it. So, Absolutely. Okay. Um, the next, there are quite a few questions about GPA and the TOEFL score. So how important, you know, if they have an average GPA, or how, how important is that in the application process and the TOEFL score? Do you there be yeah, a... Yeah, Rami, you want to answer, or you, you want me so, so the TOEFL score, we already spoke about it, okay? So the, for the TOEFL score, it's, it's better to have high TOEFL score because some school has a cut score either for GPA or for the TOEFL. So we already covered the TOEFL. For the GPA, there is a cut score. means that they will not even look into your application. So for example, I don't know, I think you test at University of Texas in San Antonio, the cut score is 3.0. 3 so if you are 2.8, most probably they will not even look into the application. So it's, is it important? Yes, it's very important. But at the same time, I know people with 2.85 and got into a very competitive program because they have a very strong resume and they have a whole one year of U.S. experience. So it is important. Of course it is important. And if you, if you are below the cut score, it's going to be way harder for you to get in because the, the problem is that they will not even look at the, the application at all. So it's very important to that the GPA be uh, good. However, if it's below three, do not, like it's not the end of the world. Some schools might accept that and some schools might take you in, and, and yeah, I think this is, this is what I would say. I All agree right. with Rami. Uh, I would say, absolutely, just like he said, the cutoffs, so you want to make sure you are above the cutoffs. If you are barely on the border, 
then you really want to make sure that you hi, uh, then you then you have additional things to put on your resume or your application to show that you are a strong candidate and you want to highlight them that's it's more about how you present yourself I know you know let's say the TOEFL score is less but if you are going to highlight that then nobody's going to want to interview uh, you so basically you want to make it as strong as possible TOEFL is a great thing about it you can practice 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 and apply up, up here for it again and um, it does make difference uh, I had friends of mine they appeared once and they got nervous they couldn't perform well they practiced for two three months they reappeared and they did very well and they reapplied they updated it's look let's say your score is less doesn't mean it's the end of the world you still go ahead and apply if you are if you want to meet the deadline but once you have finish finish the score um, you practice again you reappear and update the school with the new score and that that should help you regarding GPA no you can not change it but you can add a few more things like it can be shadowing experience it can be anything else you can you can all let's say if you if you work at a library or if you work in some other place you can show them even though it's not dental related work experience you can still put that instead of nothing and you can show them that okay uh, this is what I did during this time and this is what I learned and I am excited and I want to apply towards dentistry and I'm happy about it everyone understands that life comes in the picture you cannot be in touch with dentistry all the time you cannot be it all about dentistry sometimes you have to take time off to do what you gotta do and, and what matters at this time is how, it's all about how you show your how about how you present yourself okay so next is someone wanting to know some tips on preparing for interviews so if either of you could share how you prepared for your interviews for dental school I I can answer the question. So for, for preparing interview, there are different things you can do. One, you want to write down. This is how I did it. Okay, I wrote down all the possible questions that they can ask. You also want to look at your personal statement and <clears throat> put yourself in interview shoes and think of the questions that you might want to ask to this candidate and so you you try to figure out all the questions that can be possibly asked that's your step one step two you write them down step three you want to practice and you want to practice to sound naturally even though you're nervous you should be able to speak to that point point. and fourth um, you want to practice in front of someone else if you got nobody or you feel uncomfortable then practice in front of a mirror if you can see in the mirror and convince yourself that your body language, your words, your passion, everything goes in harmony, then you're fine. That's all you look. That's all they're looking for. Rami, you want to add something? Um, I think I think the guide that um, that we published today it has a lot of things, has a lot of tips. It covers everything related to the interview, but. Uh, the interview is two, two sections or two parts. Most of the schools, they have the bench exam and they have the person interview. So for the particular interview, as Mar said, you have to read, read online about the common questions. For example, what's your weakest point? Be prepared to these questions. Uh, be comfortable. Be confident. Do not be overconfident. And, and uh, do not, like, you have, you have to show them yourself. It means that you have to show them that you can be a student again. Most of us were already licensed in our home countries. And you don't want anyone who do not want to learn more, right? Because you'll be a student again. So you have to show how you can be a student again, you can accept criticism, and, and uh, you can be integrated and, and think there. So, but I, I would really encourage the person who asked that question to read the, the guide. We have a lot of 
a lot of tips that covers both sections. Uh, the other resource is Google. Uh, Google has all the tips on answering the interview questions. They have all the tips of how to prepare for interview. The same, the same answer that I'm giving you, you'll find maybe a different answer. There's something that you can pick and use it for your interview. Um, you want, again, just like I said about the personal statement, you want to be concise. Uh, you, want, you, you don't want to be sounding choppy. You, you want to sound fluent. Practice, uh, that will help big time. And if you would ask me, this is, this is a very broad question, the tips for preparing interview. And, but if, if you guys would ask me a specific question, I can probably answer you better. For example, tell me about yourself. What are you, how do you answer the question for the strengths? How do you answer the question for the weakness? Things like that. Okay. The next question is asking if membership in ASDA and ADA or other organizations increase the chances of getting an interview. Where, I, think, I think yes. If, I think yes. Um, if you can show that you did and uh, not what I mean by you can show, of course you can show, but in your in your personal statement you can you can make a small line that hey I was excited and I, I'd like to be in touch with dentistry in the US so even though I did not have any uh, opportunity to shadow a dentist or or to be part of any organi or dental organization uh, any office environment you you signed up for ADA and you received the newsletter you you reviewed um, some of the dental magazines. This is what you learned, and you're excited about. Um, I think I think it might look good, but it doesn't have a lot of weight, though. So, so it doesn't have a lot of weight in your application. It might look fine, but at the same time, you have to know. I remember in ASDA or ADA, just that you went online and you paid the fees. So. It's, it, it looks good that you're interested in the U.S. system and you're interested in to know about the, what's happening in the American Dental Association, what's happening in the American Student Dental Association, but at the same time, do not put a lot of weight in that because I don't think, I, I mean, uh, talking to program directors, I didn't hear anyone <laughs> saying anything about uh, that. Um, it has a lot of weight. It, it might show interest, but I, it, it doesn't have a lot of weight. I think it's just that it's it's one way to show your excitement, um, your passion about dentistry, and you can definitely when if you are going to say that in an interview, I think it's something that will make you unique because not a lot of people do it. Plus, you can add a story to it. You can say, "Hey, I I like the dentistry in US so much that I signed up for it. I reviewed so many articles." Um, and I really like the article about this and you can tell something about it to prove your point and I think that's how it will help. Yeah, I, I agree. I think where ASDA and the ADA can help is preparing you for some of those interview questions, reading our publications and, you know, our blog and things like that talks about issues that are happening in dentistry in the U.S. So it, it helps educate you when you walk into those interviews. Um, we had another question kind of related to membership that I can answer, and someone's asking that if you are a dentist and recently moved to the U.S., which membership category? So you would be considered a pre-dental member. So pre-dental members can be those in the U.S. who are you know, a traditional student in an undergrad program, but it also does include those international dentists who are in the U.S. and are thinking or interested in applying for either a residency or an advanced standing program. So anyone who's interested in becoming a dentist in the U.S. would qualify for that pre-dental membership category. Um, the next question is asking if the LOR expires. I, I think that may mean letter of recommendation. Mm -hmm. So is there a time frame 
um, on those. Do you want to answer? Uh, depend, I think it depends on the school. Some schools they want you to have it in the most common thing is to have it to have it in one year. So uh, so to have it in one year, this is the most common school. But you have you have to, to check. They do not officially expire, but you want to have something as recent as possible. And some schools uh, they want they want they recommend that this letter of recommendation uh, should be uh, you should have it in the in the like the past one year or something. So this is that's what I think. I I I applied about five six years ago. No, not five six four years ago. At that time it was six months. Again, just like Rami said, for certain school it's different. It's usually about six months for this. The minimum time is six months. But what I did, I just didn't put any date in my letter of recommendation. And that way no one can question how old it was. And nobody ever questioned me if it is expired or not. But they expect it to be in six months. OK. So the next question has to do with being published. So they're asking, they're saying that it's difficult um, getting published at a graduate research program. Is there, do you have any suggestions for how someone could be, get published? I mean, I know. Well, um, uh, the, the, the first part of the question, I have an issue with it. It says uh, most people who got in dental school uh, always have numerous publication. I, I don't think this is correct. Maybe this is what you might hear from SDN, but I don't think this is correct at all. Uh, a lot of people, I got in without any publications before dental school, and a lot of people got in without publications. Uh, it might make you look good, yeah, but I don't think it's something most people who got, like the question you think that most of the people who got into dental school, no, it's not most of the people. Actually, it's quite few who have publications and, and got in. Might, might make them look good, but I know people who have publications and they didn't get in. So it's not really, uh, it's not really that, that big uh, thing. They, they will, they'll make, it, it will make you look good though. So for, however, uh, how, how else can we publish? I think as that is one, one of the things, one of the places that you can publish, I, uh, I think, Danielle, like two yes. days back, we had an international student who published in the ASDA blog, and anything you write for ASDA is a publication. And she's an international student, and she didn't even get accepted at any as dental school yet. So ASDA, I think it's one of the big places that you can, you can uh, publish at, and um, and yeah, this is this is what I have for that. But if you are doing research with someone, you, you, he might guide you what to publish and where to publish. But as that, I think it's a great way, a great place to, to publish. Absolutely, we um, definitely uh, look for authors of all different backgrounds and experiences. So, you know, many of the the individuals who write articles are current dental students, but we also have various pre-dentals, international. So um, for anyone who is interested in writing an article, um, if you go on to our website under the communications tab, there's an area for write for ASDA, and that gives you more information. Um, the next question might be best answered by Hani, because it has to do with the visa. It's asking, while I'm in dental school, can we switch from a J2 visa to any other? So maybe if you could talk a little bit about what visa. Oh, you're... Um, the J2 visa is a... Hello? Yep, we can hear you. So the J2 visa is an exchange program visa that comes in two types. That says that after you finish with your program, you have to leave the country for two years and then come back to the United States if you want to come back to the United States. The other one comes with no um, One with the restriction, you cannot change that to a different visa. Okay? Um, the thing is interest waiver, uh, and that happens saying to the um, U.S. government that there is 
here in the United States. You're going to be working in dentist, um, or you're going to be and um, that way you can get that two-year requirement um, uh, way have a two-year requirement in there or two-year restriction um, you can switch from a J2 visa to a different kind of visa after that like an H1B visa or a TN visa if you're a citizen of Canada and Mexico okay thank you um, the next question is asking about the dental school um, outside of the U.S. where the person attended. They want to know, does my dental school's reputation count if I apply to an American dental school? So I guess how important is the school you attended in your country of origin? Uh, I think it's true. The dental school's reputation does count of dental school it's based is the program's experience has been with the previous students from the same dental school there are certain dental schools that they already know the people that are applying from is not you're not the worst one and they have excelled and they have done good yeah because the dental school in the with the basics and the concepts of dentistry. So the dental schools here, they know already if you're going to apply for But if you are in the world. I mean, I don't know if you have anything else to add. King, uh, um let's say I'm a program director and I have and he, he was a good person and he was a team player and everything. But this would give a good impression of the dentist school. However, um, I think the receiver well, and it's very hard to remember. So there is reputation? Yes, there is reputation. Is it something? Uh, not at all. I know, I know people from schools do not have the best reputation on that end one of the best competitive. Um, so do not, do, like, do not get confused. It's not, this is not, doesn't have a lot of, I uh, agree on what I'm saying. It doesn't have, okay? And, and when you graduate from that, then, so it's not something that has a lot of weight that should stop you or that you can even that you should even think about it I think this is how what I, what I learned uh, was something someone in admission committee now how true but look the point is and there is no point anyone thinking I think you want to Disappointment is a good emotion if you approach it properly. Could you want to highlight your strengths? And do I know or do you know which schools they consider good? You don't know, neither do I. So why worry about it? Instead, application and other things. Okay, um, the next question is from someone who is currently an advanced standing student and on a student visa, and they want to know if there are nonprofit organizations um, that they could work at for international students who are on a visa. So I don't know, honey, if you want to talk a little bit about what sort of things they can do on a visa and what they couldn't do on a visa? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll handle the, the, let me just put my camera on, or it's on. The legal part of this is that um, you have something called an OPT, which is 
um, that is um, an allowance to go ahead and either work during the student visa or with the student visa. It doesn't have to be for compensation. So it could be with an turn with them. It doesn't have to be necessary. Um, with the OPT, you have up to 29 months that you can take after graduate. Uh, something like a nonprofit, provided they provide a, a letter of employment, the CIS showing that there is an uh, uh, and that they're certified that you'll go ahead and employ and you're working with them. Um, OPT also could be done during um, your studies. Um, the fa uh, you're allowed to work up to 20 hours during your studies, so if you have a part-time job or something like that, you can go ahead and do that during your during the study, your studies is that it has to be done after one year of fin or, or after finishing one year of studies. You can't do it from the beginning. So you have to do your OPT after you finished one academic year on your studies. Okay. Um, let's see. So the next question. Um, this person graduated 10 years ago from dental school in their country and wondering if they're still eligible for an advanced standing program. Is there any sort of uh, time frame from when you became uh, a dentist to when you can apply for advanced standing or age or anything? Absolutely. You're absolutely um there is no reason you, that's the you can apply for dental school even though you are 60 years old. I know a friend of mine who was actually in IT for 10 years after graduating from dental school in India. And then he came to the advanced standing program. I know another dentist friend of mine who was a dentist in India and he was practicing. He had his his own practice, he was doing extremely good and he applied for the advanced training program. He got a the only problem with that <clears throat> is that getting a recommendation letter from the dean of your dental school. Uh, so that's, that's the hard part. Uh, the admission committee of the school tell them, hey, this is the program. 10 years ago, my dean is changed. What should I do? And they will they will answer you what you can do. Rami, you wanna add something to it? No, are you eligible? You have 10% eligible. There's nothing says that I'm not eligible at all. But Oh, I think you might have gotten muted for a moment. Sorry. Uh, I was muted, you were saying? Yeah, uh, I, I think so. <laughs> okay, no. So, so I was saying that, yeah, you're 100% eligible. And, and, um, but, however, it's better to make a decision and make your mind uh, as soon as possible. Like, if you're, if you're a program director and you had 50 years old and you had a 23 years old, are both applying to the same spot automatically I think you will need to get 20 years old so so it's uh, I mean the examples that can are said and give they are amazing examples so this should not stop you from from getting the, the program at all so now you are totally hundred percent okay um, the next question has to do about funding so what are ways to be funded for the high fees of an uh, international dental program? Maybe so, there are different ways. There are different ways uh, for funding. One of the the most popular one is the private student. We, if you are 
or here on the student visa or in card holder, then you are not eligible for. You'll be looking for or money from your home country or who can help you fund your student to get the student loans or oh, it's really difficult and it's it's a hard part for so many people and I had in my people are looking for help they can find the I didn't have any relatives or any any blood relatives uh, any uncle in India I had my brothers childhood bro uh, childhood friend who helped me co-sign my loan so there are people out there who can help you um, but okay to answer your question if you are a US citizen or a green card holder then FAFSA um, and I don't know if, if anything else you want to. The question is about the funding. So if you are talking about loans, you well, uh, private loans, but you are talking and stuff like that, you are not eligible for that. So if you question about the private loans, yes, you need a co-signer, and and you can get a private loan. But if you question about can have uh, you can you can have a fin um, uh, if you're not a citizen you can have a financial aid but for scholarships you, you most probably no school and there's no decrease in the amount that you have to pay so this is your question on this pretty much it. I'm sorry a private student have a co-signer if you are not a US citizen and, and the good thing about it if you have a, a green card holder then even if you do not have credit history they will give you ones that was 2009 that was the ones that are slightly more liberal than so vendors are more lenient. I'm talking about the banks in California. Uh, mo most of them do not a social security number. So this is another issue. Um, and and if you want um, a private loan, uh, so most of them they need SSA. If you're, if you're a permanent resident or not. And then how to get SSN, you need to find a job on campus. From starts. Uh, it can tell us ways to get the SSN or something like that. Um, okay. So the um, next question is for Hani. Um, it's asking if the uh, DDS degree comes under STEM and is eligible for the 17th month extension. Yes, they are eligible for extension. Okay. And someone questioned, you mentioned that the OPT is 29 months. I think That's they're... Extension of 12 more months after that. Okay, so 12 plus the 17. And then, uh, sorry, 12 first and then 17, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, all right, and then there's another uh, question related to that. Um, sorry. So asking if they can volunteer at a nonprofit um, organization for uh, with an OPT extension with STEM, or do they have to get paid to be eligible for the OPT extension? Word and the question was the e-verify part. So in there, um, and 
uh, the employer goes ahead and, and uh, to indicate that you're working there, you should be fine. Okay. Um, let's see. Sorry. Um, the next one, I'm not sure who can answer this one, but is it mandatory that a co-signer on a loan um, be a U.S. citizen or green card holder, or could a co-signer on an H-1B visa work? Question. Uh, it depends. If you are not a U.S. citizen or signer, has to be U.S. citizen or green card holder and be visa. This is, as far as I know, with most of the bank, or maybe even hundred, and it doesn't hurt to ask him. Okay. Um, the next one, I'm not sure, honey, if you can answer this one. Um, the procedure about switching schools on an F1 student visa. Hello? Yes. So there's a question about what's the procedure for switching schools on an F-1 student visa? Does the visa affect the switching of schools? Let's differentiate a little bit between the visa and states. Um, the, here in the United States, you have to obtain it in the embassy outside of the United States. Label that's on your passport states a school and you, 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 you did a change of school from an I-20 from one school to another school, um, let's say school B, has, you, you're switching to that school and you filed that with, with immigration and you got an extension, so in visa status here in the United States, that's not going to change anything on your passport. If you want to change the visa that's on your passport, then you're going to have to go back to the home country, okay, apply for a, a visa, student visa, show them your I-20, and then they can issue a new visa with the name of the school on it that you want to have on there. Okay. Um, the next question, this is a particular scenario, but this might be helpful for other people to know. So this person is a current student in their final year of the, their advanced standing program. They graduate in five months. Um, so they get a year's OPT following, which they apply for an H-1 visa, and they're asking since there's a lottery system for the H-1 visa, can you talk about their chances for getting one, and if you don't get one, then what do you do? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, the chance, um, uh, let me just put it this way. This year, uh, Every year, there's 65,000 visas available for the H-1 uh, program. Um, this year, uh, um, over 85,000 applied. Um, the, actually, this is the first year in the last three years that we, the quota was actually met. Um, the um, If you end up not having um, a visa, then um, and your OPT has expired, then you'll have to return back to your home country. Or, um, in a different study program, get another F1 visa, for instance, in English course language or something like that. The next round of um, uh, H1B visas. Um, if you get selected for the H1B visa program and uh, your OPT expires, the, the gap, which is between April 1st when you apply for the H-1B visa and October 1st when you're supposed to start working, your OPT will cover that gap, even though it may have expired. Okay, so you're legally staying here on principle about six months until your your um, your H or following the April where you select. 
I, I would like to add something here, honey. Uh, based on the information that I have, let's say if you don't get into lot H1B lottery, there are also different. There is also another H1B way for non. So let's say you you are on OPD and you are working, and your employer filed your H1B, and let's say worst case happens you don't get selected one you continue to work at the dentist but you have to switch the employer to a non-profit organization and have them file your H1B they do not have any quota there is there is no limit for organizations so they can file it and it will get approved and you can still continue to work for that nonprofit organization. The catch here is though, if let's say uh, you want to switch an employer, let's say you started working for the community health center, right? After six months, you want to quit the job, or you, or they fire you, or you have to change the job, basically, to any personal. Uh, any, any private dental office basically or any corporate chains. You have to switch to another non-profit organization only and have them transfer your H1B. So that's the catch until you can get into the regular April cycle for the next year and get selected in lottery. After that you can go anywhere you want. But that's the other way to turn, turn things around. The, the third option would be you can also look into working for a dental school as a faculty and that is also or you can go into a non-profit research organization and work for them. So that there. So. I just want to clarify the H1B non-profit part. Um, the requirements are that it has to be somehow related to an institution of higher education. So there are three types in that, but they have to be related to um, a non uh, an educational institution. So it's either a research lab or in the school itself or uh, something uh, to do with that educational institution. Okay. So the next question is uh, regarding a visa as well, but what kind of visa do they need to take the national boards part one and stay in the U.S. until they apply for part two? I honestly don't have any idea about that one because okay. I don't know the, what the requirements are. I think somebody who went through it, uh, like Rami or... Uh, so, so for part one or part two, you can be on, on B1 visa, the regular visa that you're visiting the country. However, you can you can stay. It's valid for six months maximum, and you can you can you can plan to take the part one on the first month that you come here, and part two on the last month. However, you cannot extend. So, it's like it's like a green card for six months, and so you can take it on on the tourist visa, which is B1, B2. And and uh, and you'll have if you want to take part one or part two of the same visit, you'll have to make it happen in the window of six months. Okay. The next question is: How important is U.S. experience, like an observership? What if a person is on a visitor visa and can't get much experience in the U.S.? you want to answer? Uh, I, I want to re repeat the question again. It says how important is US experience, USA experience like observership, 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 observership and cannot get much experience in the US. So something that you cannot do, so so get it out of your head. I mean, do not keep thinking about it. I mean, I didn't have any US experience. I didn't know anybody uh, here in the US at all. And, and and I got in. So so how important? It, it's fine, um, but it can might look good, but it, it has nothing. It doesn't affect. So um, so yeah, if you are a visitor visa and you cannot do um, 
if you can not do uh, observership, this this doesn't stop you or this this decreases your chance at all. It might increase you. Okay, so so uh, so do not put this in your. I don't think this is correct. Okay. You can have an opportunity. Can you? Can you? Can you? Hello. Hello. Yes. Yeah. I'm. I'm getting. Again, uh, what I'm trying to say here is that basically, yes, if you can have an opportunity, you should absolutely try. You can highlight it, highlight that in your application. And you can show uh, that how your experience has helped you apply to the dental school here. What are the things that uh, really interested about? You can you can actually mention them in your interview, and you can explain them. Okay, I learned about this. I learned about that system. The system B Optra. Be a little bit okay. I learned about all this, and I want to be able to practice all that. All right. Um, the next question is for Tanar and so all dental schools ask the question, why are you applying for an advanced standing program? And the answer usually is because I want to practice in the U.S. But they're asking, how can they have an answer that will make them stand out? Okay, uh, I want to repeat that question. I ask this question, why are you applying for the advanced standing program? Um, to practice here, how can I have an answer that will make me stand out? So, this answer is not even straight to the point. It means that advanced learning program is not the only way you can practice here. You can go to a residency program. So, you, you might want to come out that shows that you are, you are applying here for that because you can apply, you can, you can practice to go for a DDS for, to learn about general dentistry, not about PERU because you can apply to PERU directly, not, about, not, not to ENDO, not to ortho, you can apply to all these residency programs directly. You want to be, you want to learn more about general dentistry. So, so I think it, it's, 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 you need to know actually give it up how, how it is. I'm applying to this program because of one, two, three, and that's pretty much it. But I, I think uh, our people can practice without DDS at all. But that you hope to practice, not just hope to practice, but you, you've seen someone, let's say you were doing observation, and you saw something that how he practices, how he, uh, how he enjoys working in the um, and owning a dental practice, and you want to see yourself in that situation. That's one way to answer. Or you can go, hey, I uh, see an oral surgeon. I want to be an oral surgeon practicing here. Um, you can, so for, to get into the residency program, dental school is the way, is one of the milestones and you are and that's that's why you are here so you can see that um, my family is going to be here so and i'm so passionate about dentistry i don't want to change my career and i love dentistry i love your program i've heard so many good things about it and so i'm interested for your program so there are different ways you can present yourself what makes sense to you and what All right. Uh, the next right. question has to do with research. So, how important is research? How important is research? 
experience. And if it is good to have research experience, should it be dental related or can it be in any other medical field like genetics or cell biology? Okay. Um, okay. So, so the question is saying how important is to have research experience, and if it's good to have research experience, um, if it's good to have research experience about dentistry or something, uh, or any medical field. So, research is is kind of might make you look different, but still, it's not it's not the thing that if you don't have it, you'll have a big trouble. Okay. Um, so it's good to have it. It's it's how important it is. I, it's, it has a lot of importance unless you have publications that that when they Google your name in PubMed, for example, they can find your paper publications about that. So um, uh, so it might it might make you look better. However, your research doesn't it means that if you found a spot in a research lab about whatever it is. Of the so anything related to biology, this will look good as well. Dentistry related, but but at the same time, do not go that far. Like you are talking about something has nothing to do with your field at all. So genetics, for example, it affects dentistry because right now we are thinking how genes are affecting implants, for example, the research that I'm doing and everything. So do not go far. Okay, so. It doesn't have to be related to composite and amalgam, but at the same time, do not go research about hair, for example. So, I I would. Did I have a research experience? Yes, I did. It was something I did to strengthen my profile. Does it help? It's just one of the extra things. Put yourself as an outstanding candidate. Just like Ramis, who be around industry and not go to. Basically, the intention should be you want to get a good recommendation. One more additional letter of recommendation. And they can highlight, it doesn't have to be related to dentistry. It's going to highlight your personal, your, your work ethic, how professional you are, uh, you present yourself, just polite, honest, upfront. Those are so, uh, these things, and that will help you. Uh, what I did in my, uh, Basically, I start. I applied for the dental. Once I started doing it, it's. I was about my date of interview, so four or five months was good enough time. End of the time, I asked my. Hey, could you write me a letter of recommendation? So. I didn't, but admission committee, as soon as I started uh, in this uh, research institute and, and I'm learning this, please update, and I would like to read, and the research, the admission, and when, you, when I went to the interview, I, what I did was, I just told who I was, what I'm working on, what we, and the director uh, who, he was, he was a, a big the editor of the, one of the fear, and I told him that, hey, uh, this is a, a letter of recommendation for me pull it out, you hand it to the interviewer and they will take a look at it. So that is how you can use your to your advantage. 
I'm muted. All right, so we, I think we have time for one last one question. Last question. Um, and I think this one will be to Hani. And this is, under which category is the green card of a dentist working on H-1B filed? EB-1, EB-2, and EB, or EB-3? And then who can help file it? Oh, sorry. I think you were muted. Okay, so dentists fall uh, in either EB2 or EB3. Yes. Reserved for people or national, foreign national professionals holding advanced degrees, exceptional in their field. Um, EB3 in their field. Um, the better category, if you have an outstanding research in publication history showing that um, uh, you uh, rise above um, your field and that you're in the top echelon of your field. Uh, most dentists category, which is the category that um, um, not is something called the labor certificate process in which the employer must go ahead and do advertisement and and uh, all of that to indicate that there's no U.S. national um, wants to take that job and after that uh, the, you're approved uh, to go ahead and submit your green card application and you'll have to wait until you become current. Um, the time right now or the uh, process of application for you to become current on your green card process is about a year and a half right now. If you're um, green card application and everything is done in the sixth year of your H-1B, um, your H-1B can be extended as long as it takes for you to obtain uh, your green card through the EB-3 process. Um, so if, uh, if you are in dental school right now, if you can go ahead and provide a body of research material and a body of publication, you'll be able to get a much easier uh, uh, process later on to get a green card. If not, then you'll have to go through the EB-3 process. Uh, and um, in both cases, the employer must be the person that finishes the process for you. You cannot be somebody who do, does it on their own. The employer has to be the person who does it for you. Okay. Great. All right. I think that brings us to the end. Um, so we would really like to thank everyone for attending tonight's program. Um, I apologize. We got through as many questions as we could. If you have a specific question for one of our panelists, um, you can contact them directly. Their information is posted on the screen. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this program is recorded and it will be posted on our website. Um, the link will be sent out to everybody who's registered for the program. So if there are individuals you know who couldn't attend tonight, they'll be able to watch this program at a future date. Uh, we do plan on holding additional programs in the future, so watch for our emails and we'll announce new programs coming up. So I'd like to thank everyone and have a good night.